My name's Sarah Dickinson and this is Willem Turup of NLNet Labs and we're going to be talking today about GetDNS which is um, a API and a library for DNS resolution. We would like to make this very hands-on so if there are, are those of you in the audience who are very interested in having a look at the code um, and using it throughout the tutorial we'd like you to encourage you to do that. We'd also encourage people to uh, interrupt us with questions as we talk. We'd like it to be very informal because we want you to get the most out of this. Um, what we're going to cover, first of all, is what exactly is the GetDNS API? Um, why did it come about? What was the motivation behind it? We'll then go on to talk about an implementation of that API, the GetDNS library, and give you a tour of the features that are available in that implementation. Willem will then take you on a detailed tour of the API itself, showing you some of the uh, novel characteristics it has for a DNS <coughs> API. Um, and then he'll take you through some example uses of the API to do some common and some unusual uh, um, lookups. Um, so there will be code at that point. Um, and if there's time, we'll do a very brief demo of Stubby, which is an application built on top of GetDNS. Um, First of all, though, if you are interested in grabbing the code, um, we wanted to give you some pointers to it. Unfortunately, I believe the slides aren't yet available, so um, I'll go through this quickly. Yep. I, I think I put them on the uh, static uh, okay. uh, part of the website. So yeah. um, GetDNS has a home page, which is getdnsapi.net. If you go there and put a slash static on that path, there should be... Um, a directory with lots of installers on. Um, I can see a fair few different platforms here. Um, I think we have at least one of each. Um, for <laughs> um, so for those of you on Ubuntu, you can actually get it, um, do a, a, an apt install. And there's uh, the packages are uh, DNS utils, Python get DNS, and lib get DNS dev. If you're on Mac, you can grab it through Homebrew. It's really straightforward. You just do a brew install, get DNS, and you'll have the latest version. Um, you can go to the get DNS homepage. There's a link there so you can see the latest release tarball. In the README, there are instructions of how to install it. Um, so it's simpler to build it, obviously, from the tarball. But if you're hardcore and you like to grab code, you can also clone from our Git repo, which is, again, linked from the get DNS homepage and um, instructions there, which I will have to skip quite quickly. Um, if you're a Windows user, um, if you go to the getdnsapi.net slash static page, there are Windows installers there, a stubby.exe and a getdns.exe, getdnsquery.exe yeah. that you can grab. Um, as I go through this first set of slides, though, Willem will be available to help anybody who would like to install it and has any trouble. So if you're in that situation, please just raise your hand, hand and Willem will wander around and, and help you out with that. If you do grab this, one thing you can do is use a tool called GetDNS Query, which is a command line wrapper to the API. So it's, it's a little bit like Dig, but it's, it's way more, and it exposes virtually all the functionality that's within the library. And what it importantly does for the rest of the talk is it will show you the responses you get back in the particular format that GetDNS uses, which is a JSON dict. So that's quite a lot easier to read on your own screen than it is off these slides. So um, that's why having that locally is very helpful. Um, and here is a few examples, but uh, use the help and figure it out from there. If you know Dig, you can probably work your way through this. Um, okay, so okay. with that, yeah. yep, I will um, continue with the first part of the talk. So what we wanted to do was start by setting the scene for where the GetDNS API came from. And it tries to define itself with one sentence by saying that it is an API written by and for application developers. So this is different to a lot of DNS APIs. And the reason that approach was taken is that with all the recent evolution in the DNS protocol, the reality is that Get Agile Info really just can't cope with the new standards that are available and the new features that DNS really needs to be taking advantage of. There is so much more in the DNS now than just name lookups. Um, there's a whole range of Dane related records, there's protocol signaling, there's a huge amount here which um, can't be signaled up to applications through the traditional API. 
The other thing that's changed a lot is that a huge number of applications now really need asynchronous lookups, um, and Get Adria Info can't deliver that either. Um, in particular, there are some new standards around doing happy eyeballs, going and fetching v6 first, and so you need um, an asynchronous API to deliver that. Um, crucially, what's becoming more important is being able to do DNSSEC validation um, on the end device as a stub, and Get Adria Info again can't expose that. And another key feature which is becoming more and more relevant is the ability to do DNS privacy, and that really means today doing DNS over TLS. And again, there are very few implementations around that offer that functionality that Get DNS does. So although there were a fair number of other DNS APIs around, and some of them were very good, we'd really found that there was little update, uptake from them from application developers. And one of the comments they made were that DNS APIs were written by DNS folks for DNS folks, and they really didn't fit into modern programming structures. So the goal here was to create the successor to Get Adra Info in that context. So work on this API first started in 2013. Paul Hoffman originally edited it. Um, it's currently published again under the getdnsapi.net uh, homepage, so you can have a, a look um, through that. And it is these days it's now maintained by the GetDNS development team. We now have ownership of that. So the API was specified, and then an initial implementation effort was, was actually started by Alison Mankin, who at the time worked at VeriSign Labs. Um, and she got on board a variety of collaborators to do this, including NLNet Labs, uh, Melinda Shaw of No Mountain Software, and Synodon. And we've been working on that um, ever since. Uh, a potted history. We, uh, the first release went out in 2014, a 0.1 release. Um, we took over editing the API shortly after that. Um, some New extensions were made to the API directly from informed by the implementation experience in 2015, making it more friendly. In 2016, we worked through uh, some alpha and beta releases heading towards production, and we actually released the first production release in January of this year. That was the 1.0. And we declared that a 1.0 because it was 100% uh, specification complete with regard to the original API. We fairly rapidly followed that up with a 1.1 release because the Get uh, DNS library implementation not only implements the original API, but it goes above and beyond and actually offers a whole range of really useful functionality that wasn't in the original API. And the 1.1 release exposes uh, a lot of that work. Um, so I've mentioned there's a core team. We, we meet weekly, we're very active on this, but I do want to point out the huge number of contributors that has been over the lifetime of this project. Um, so they're all the folks in black and the people who are still currently active today are the folks in red. One thing that we tried to do very differently with GetDNS is we didn't want to sort of have an API and silo ourselves away as developers and then just pop out with a 1.0 production release at some point. We kind of tried to do the opposite. We tried to be really, really active and going out in developing new features actively at hackathons, talking to developers, getting feedback, and being really willing to change the API as we did this. And this happened in practice and it happened really well. Um, so the GetDNS team, I guess you could call this, these are unofficial face-to-face -face meetings. We go to the IETF three times a year. We have a really strong presence at the hackathon. The first couple of times we were there, we made quite a splash and won some of the prizes, best in show and best internet security. Um, but we just found it such a productive way to develop this API that we've been going ever since. So a whole range of work has been done. Um, just um, at the last uh, hackathon, we, for example, produced a Nagios uh, monitoring plugin based on GetDNS to monitor DNS over TLS servers. And that's in use on a website today to um, to, to show the availability of some experimental servers. And it's all get DNS under the hood. Um, so if from the README, there's certain things we very specifically wanted to do. So we really want to take DNS and modern, crypt modern cryptographic functionality to application developers and expose it to them in a way that means that they can then start to do novel things with that, things they can't do today because they're limited by the APIs and therefore have an impact on the way application developers are picking up things like privacy and DNSSEC. So one of the reasons that um, 
exposing DNA sec is so crucial in terms of getting applications to move forward is that you can argue, I mean, I know um, Let's Encrypt has revived the use of certificates recently, which has been very interesting, but other people would argue that the regular PKI model is actually fundamentally flawed in the way it does trust. And particularly from a DNS perspective, what we're interested in doing is moving towards Dane, which provides a different, more rigorous model. But to do that, you need a stub resolver that can reliably get DNSSEC results. Um, so there's a label here that says first mile, last mile. So that's really referring to the stub to recursive um, part of DNS resolution. And interestingly, we found it depends whether you're an implementer or an operator as to whether you consider it the first or the last mile. So I've, I've, we've got a label allowing for both here. Um, what we're really talking about is from your stub, if you want to get DNSSEC validated results, today in most environments, you have to trust your recursing resolver. Now, maybe that's okay when you're at home and you're talking to your ISP. However, when you're out and about, you're using your phone on some unknown Wi-Fi, there's still the possibility of a malicious resolver sending you false information about DNSSEC security. And this is a huge issue. So do you trust your resolver? Another issue is that even if your resolver tells you something isn't secure, as a stub, you get just a single signal, good or bad, basically, secure or bogus. What you don't get is any visibility at all of where the chain of trust was broken. So the solution to this problem is really to be able to have the capability when you need it to do DNSSEC resolution as a stub on your end device. Um, so in this example, we're showing that happening from a stub talking to a DNSSEC aware resolver. So the um, recursor is still uh, caching the responses so the stub can take advantage all of that caching um, itself. But all the DNSSEC records are actually flowing back to the stub and the validation is being do done there. So you can see exactly what's going on. Of course, the catch here is you need a DNSSEC aware resolver. And if you don't have one, what one of the nice things about GetDNS is that it actually allows you, if you need to, to fall back further and act as a full recursor from your stub and do DNSSEC validation straight up to the authoritatives. So GetDNS fully implements DNSSEC roadblock avoidance that it will cascade through all these possibilities to ensure that you can actually get um, properly validated responses to your stub. As I mentioned, one of the other features that's um, uh, around a lot at the moment is DNS uh, over TLS. Again, GetDNS is probably the most fully featured stub today with regards to being able to provide this. So this is stub to recursive again. So that's encrypting and authenticating a connection from your stub to recursive to provide privacy on all those queries. Um, that sounds quite clear, but let's just do DNS over TLS. Well, it turns out it really isn't that easy. And there's been a huge amount of work in the standards to improve how stubs do TCP and TLS. Um, one of the things that stubs historically did was just one-shot TCP. If they needed to do TCP, they'd open connection, fire a query, get a response, and shut it down. And of course, that's incredibly inefficient. The specs have been revised, and the specs now say that isn't how you should do it. The specs describe how to do optimized um, connections. So you should use uh, TCP fast open if you have it, which reduces latency and handshake. When you open a connection, you should reuse it. Uh, a little more on the next slide on that. Again, in GetDNS, we have um, implemented uh, more of the specs. There's an option called Keep Alive, where a client can signal to a server that I've got this nice implementation. I can handle connections staying open, and I'd like them to. And if the server is willing, it will leave the connection up. Um, and also, to preserve privacy even further, we've implemented a padding option where um, in the eDNS option, you can pad your query, um, and there are various policies you can use, but this padding allows you to hide the size of your DNS message. And this is actually crucial in defeating traffic analysis because it turns out through some very interesting work, it shows that if all you do is encrypt your DNS, uh, an attacker with enough visibility of the messaging can still infer a huge amount of information 
just from the message sizes because DNS traffic is so characteristic in terms of timing and query sizes. So padding is absolutely crucial to obfuscate what's going on on this connection. And we'll hear much more about that uh, this afternoon. Um, I mentioned using these connections well to achieve privacy. Um, better than just doing one-shot TCP is reusing a connection. Um, but better than doing that is reusing it and pipelining queries. You find in a lot of existing stub implementations today that what they will do is they will send one query on a TCP connection and they'll wait to get the response before they send the next one. So again, it's just really inefficient. GetDNS doesn't take that approach. Once it's opened a connection, it will pipeline all its queries up to the server. And if the server is behaving uh, according to the new specs, what it should do is concurrently process those queries. So for example, the first query in that queue, A, um, the answer might not be in the cache. It might have to go and recurse to find it, whereas query B might be in the cache and it can answer it much quickly. So what you want the server to do is actually send back B before A if it can do it. Um, and what we also discovered when we were working on this is that most stubs can't handle that. If you send them responses out of order, they get very, very confused and fall over. Um, GetDNS is compliant with the new specs in that it will handle getting responses in any order on a given TCP connection. And the upshot of all this work is that if you have a stub that behaves in this way and if you have a server that is spec compliant, Doing this and keeping persistent connections open, you can get performance on a par with UDP by doing DNS over TLS. And that's really where we need to be to make privacy practical. So those are the key features that are in the current release of GetDNS. Um, what are we doing for our next release? So the 1.2 release is something we're going to be working on at the Hackathon at IETF in a couple of weeks. And two of the key features are related to, uh, we all know about the upcoming um, uh, KSK rollover. So one thing we want to do is have zero configuration DNS sec so that uh, you, you may be familiar with the uh, unbound anchor tool which will go and fetch a root um, key for you. Um, rather than having that be separate, what we want to do is integrate that functionality into GetDNS so it really does simplify configuration. However, that poses a few challenges if you're a library because um, you're not running with the permissions of an application and you're not running as a daemon. So you have to do a little fancy footwork to get this to actually work right and Willem has been working very hard on that and uh, can, could speak about that later if you're interested. Other things on the more long-term roadmap, um, DNS 6.4 prefix discovery. So this is to aid you if you happen to be on a IPv6 only network but you want to connect to a site that only offers a v4 address. Um, so there are specs that describe how to do this using a prefix um, uh, and in combination with a DNS 6.4 compliant resolver and NAT 6.4, you can get there, but you need a stub that understands the spec as well. Um, and so that should be coming up very shortly, probably 1.3-ish, yeah. something like that, we'd hope. <laughs> um, Another thing we'd like to see in the very near future, so I mentioned uh, previously we do uh, DNS over TLS and that we'd really like to move to Dane. In the 1.1 version, you need either a name or a um, SPKI pin set in order to authenticate the certificate of the server. What we very much want to implement is actually obtaining that information through Dane records um, so that we really are self-containing the chain of trust within the DNS for DNS privacy. Um, and beyond that, there was a neat little idea that uh, came out of the work that we did, which uh, is going through the IETF at the moment, which is that um, typically when a client wants to connect to an endpoint, they might go off and get the DAME records and then make a TLS connection to the endpoint. And of course, somebody realized that endpoint is a DNS server. Can't it get the DNS, sorry, can't it get the Dane records and just provide them directly to the client without the client have to do this extra work? And the answer was, well, yes, and why don't we do that inside the TLS handshake? So what the extension allows is for the client to signal to the server that it's a validating stub and that it can validate any Dane records the server has. The server inside the server hello in the TLS handshake can then send those Dane records back and the server uh, and the, sorry, and the client does the authentication inside the handshake, gets to the stage where it 
authenticates the server and trusts it and continues with the TLS connection, saving a huge amount of latency and redundant lookups. So that's uh, quite a nice idea. Um, alongside this, um, what, what's really happened as the project's matured is that we, we initially started out building a library to an API, and then once we got there, we realized we had this fantastic tool to start building on top of, and that it was actually really timely in terms of looking at the general usage of DNS stub resolvers uh, in terms of how OSs are evolving. So we're very much actively looking at the role of a versatile stub um, on an end machine in terms of changing the landscape so that those stubs have privacy and DNSSEC security built in from the ground up. Um, a, as I said, a huge motivation for this is to expose DNSSEC to legacy applications and to be able to signal to them through APIs whether or not the records are secure or not and whether or not they have privacy. And this has taken us on to thinking about shared system components and the role of a library like get DNS in that if you for example if you're using privacy you're using stateful connections and what you really want to be doing is having a system component that re that allows applications to reuse those connections rather than every connection every application firing up its own connection so there's a lot of research around how we can uh, draw um, fit get to DNS into this landscape hopefully as a drop-in replacement for many of the existing stub resolvers um, and a lot of this work is being done uh, under the banner of Stubby, which is our friendly, helpful stub resolver, which we hope will end up and land on your laptops one day and make your lives easy. Um, so I think with that, that's uh, the end of these slides. So I will hand over now to Willem, who will uh, take you through the um, API in more detail. Yes. Oh, you don't need oh that. no, <laughs> I don't need that. <laughs> So, did any of you manage to install GetDNS with the uh, instructions? Yes? Okay. Okay, so first I um, will uh, show you the uh, look and feel of GetDNS, of the GetDNS C library, and then uh, show you how a simple query looks like in Python. Then we have an actual uh, Dane Connect example in Python, and at the end I have a, a walkthrough in how to build a, a C application. Um, yes, so GetDNS is not a typical C library in the sense that it uh, produces those uh, JSON-like uh, data structures and everything is really managed uh, in, in, in a little bit in a script-like manner. And uh, you can, uh, like DNS responses, resource records, our data fields don't have their specific type, but are all represented in those types, in dictionaries, lists, binary blobs of binary data and uh, integers. And um, so here is, for example, if you do a query with getDNS, how the answer looks like. Um, it, you have a top-level response dictionary, which could contain one or more replies, and which has the... Uh, if the replies uh, contain addresses, it will uh, list those in the just address answers. All the uh, original data is also still available, so that the actual DNS messages are in replies full as well. Uh, here is uh, what, what a reply, so those response dictionaries ha have one or more replies. This is one reply. Um, so it, it, it is actually the content of a, uh, a DNS message, but then split out in JSON-like data structure. Um, so here's the answer section. Now that all the original data, you, you see that um, this uh, address answer also has the R data row, is still there. And also the name is a binary blob with uh, the name afnik.fr, but in DNS wire format. So what the dictionary actually does is 
direct you to the right places in the DNS message. So it helps you uh, around the DNS message, but doesn't actually convert anything. It tries to be as l less intrusive, or as little intrusive uh, as possible. Uh, on our website, if you do a query and then click on response dictionary, it brings you to a form in which you can do queries with GetDNS and look at a response dictionary, which might be convenient. Or if you manage to uh, install GetDNS, then you can play around with the GetDNS query uh, tool. So <laughs> those are the uh, C functions that uh, give access to the dictionaries and to the lists. Uh, uh, there's a function to uh, to see what type is at this location in this list, uh, or what type is at this name in this dict. What's the length of the list? What's the list of names, etc. Um, <coughs> and uh, they also have companion create functions for these uh, data structures. So here's what a uh, actual query looks like in uh, C. So the, the, the API is asynchronous by default, so, but it is still possible to do a synchronous query, but you have to use a special function name with underscore sync at the end. So here we, we have queried for the name getting api.net with uh, an extension dictionary. I, I, I'm going to talk later about what that means. I put the result in uh, the response dictionary. And at the top, you can see what the response dictionary looks like. And in the second function, we are retrieving the address from the, uh, the location in the response dictionary. So it's uh, done with uh, JSON pointers. Um, so it, it traverses the response dictionary basically to the piece of information you want to get. So this um, might feel a lit little bit strange for a C library. I'm also the implementer of LDNS, which takes on a very different approach. So mind you, so this is not our design. The design was uh, done by people at the ITF talking with application developers, and we, we have did the implementation. But it has some nice properties, and one of them is that um, it maps very easily on scripting languages. So we have very good Python and Node bindings, and as you can see, it, it fits right in with what, what you use uh, common with those scripting languages to uh, approach the data. And also, if you would do, do to try the same in uh, uh, C, like uh, what, what uh, I'm also implementing in LDNS, then you need a lot of additional uh, types. And uh, it's actually quite involved to be as generic um, and um, at the same time provide all this uh <coughs> and, and, and concise at the same time. So it's a, a sort of compromise between a scripting language type of programming and, and C. So also the script-like approach allows to uh, have new uh, extensions in GetDNS without having to have uh, a new version of the library. For example, uh, applications could anticipate on uh, resource records which are not here yet. And so still, we have had a lot of comments about this style of C programming. And uh, so we have the idea of creating C bindings, which are not actually bindings, of course, but provides the underlying uh, more C-like interface to everything that GetDNS API can do in the future. It's on the roadmap. So this is the, ge uh, the uh, general lookup uh, function uh, with uh, GetDNS. Uh, all settings are uh, maintained in a uh, context. It also contains the resolver cache, 
It also has all the things about timeout values, the, the trust anchors, root hints, forwarders, everything, uh, search path. Uh, name and request type, that's obvious. Then extensions are um, extra settings that are specific for that specific query you are doing. So there are a few uh, extensions like uh, do the address and the uh, uh, IPv4 and IPv6 address lookup simultaneously, uh, DNSSEC return status, which with which you ask the library to do DNSSEC validation, you could query for a different class, uh, put EDNS zero opt parameters in there. And there's uh, a especially especially uh, interesting extension which is called DNSSEC return validation chain, which return will return a uh, list of all the keys and key material uh, which were needed to prove the DNSSEC status. So if you're querying for an insecure record, it will also contain the proof that the secure delegation did not exist, etc. And uh, that all, all the things needed to prove that uh, a wildcard record is a wildcard with the proof of uh, the more specific that it, that one did not exist. And it also it 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 has it's really a, a nice a big uh, it it makes DNSSEC validation very uh, comfortable to uh, work with. It, pu it puts it in very nice big chunks of, uh, of DNSSEC data, which can be used in, for example, another uh, function we have to do f uh, DNSSEC validation outside of the lookups. So the, the last two arguments are all about um, uh, the callback function, so cattiness is asynchronous by default, so you re register a callback function. Uh, the library returns a transaction ID with which you uh, could cancel the request or do other things. And a user argument which is passed to the callback function. So here's the callback function. So here you see how those last three arguments are mapped into the callback. I will have a C example later on, if time permits. So the, the, the synchronous versions of the, uh, the lookup functions replace those three arguments with a response dictionary. We uh, besides the general lookup, there's also a specific address lookup. And it also looks in uh, ETC hosts or other system-specific uh, um, lists of uh, hostname addresses. MDNS is actually implemented currently, but in draft version, there's an implementation by Christian Huytema. And address by default tries to look up the IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. Um, there's also the reverse lookup. You feed it with an address, get a pointer record returned. And there's the service lookup, which is interesting because uh, it already does all the uh, half random sorting of server records for you and puts that in a list, which is quite convenient. So, um, there are three extensions uh, uh, delivered with GetDNS that uh, make you pick the asynchronous uh, event loop to use with GetDNS. GetDNS also has hooks in to uh, create your own uh, asynchronous event loop, but that's not in this slide deck. So here's an example query in uh, Python. First, you create a context. We uh, take all the defaults, so we don't change anything on the context. There in, in Python, you can do help uh, context, of course, and have an overview of everything which is changeable. Then 
we're, we're going to look the TLSA look up the TLSA record of Gettiness API.net. So we need we can only use this answer if it is secure, right? For a Dane lookup, it has to be secure. So the, uh, we use the extension return only secure answers. If it's not secure, we are not interesting interested. Then do the lookup of the TLSA record. So by default, Gettiness API is does the lookup in uh, recursive resolution. So if you want to do it as a step resolve and do DNSSEC validation as a step, you have to say first, we have to configure the context to do the step like a lookup. So here you see context resolution type, resolution is step. And then it does all the resolution as a step, though you need the DNSSEC aware resolver. So there's the other extension, DNSSEC roadblock avoidance. You turn that on. If DNSSEC as a step doesn't work, it falls back to full recursion. Um, so it, it l goes a little bit further than that. Actually, uh, getting as marks the upstream, which is capable uh, of doing DNSSEC or which is DNSSEC aware. And if it knows that a certain name is below a delegation point, which is insecure, then it doesn't have to fall back to full recursion to prove that it's insecure again and can just use the DNSSEC unaware resolver, but those are details. So here's a complete example of um, uh, what it would involve to make a TLSA connection. And this is uh, in Python and it's doing it synchronously. Oh no, <laughs> sorry. This is the same example query, but now asynchronously. So it's the same lookup, but uh, general now has a two extra parameters, the uh, user argument, <coughs> context, which is convenient, and uh, the callback function, process TLSA records. Um, and in, in Python, since it's not natively doing asynchronous IO, you have to run the context. Uh, in Node, this is the same example, but then in Node. Node does asynchronous processing by default. So this is actually uh, the natural way to uh, program in Node. And you don't have to run anything. It will do the lookups asynchronously and call the callback when the TLSAs have arrived. So here is the complete Python example of doing uh, actually a uh, Dan lookup. Uh, it's a program, you, you feed it with a name, and it's going to uh, add a port number, which defaults to 443, which is for HTTPS, connects to that server, checks if the TLSA record matches the certificate, and then returns the status. So it's, it involves uh, a little bit of uh, uh, crypto. Uh, we will do it as a uh, step resolver, uh, road lock avoidance. So first, uh, we, we look up the TLSA record with uh, um, the hostname and the port given on the command line. Then, if we found it, uh, oh, with the extension only secure answers, otherwise the TLSA record is not usable. If we do have a good answer, we traverse the response dictionary here in this uh, nested for loop and uh, get a list of all the TLSA records, uh, handle the errors, you know, if it's time out, uh, exit. If it's bogus, you're not allowed to connect with Dane. Right? If, if it doesn't exist, then it's just ordinary PKIX. Um, yeah, so this is a little bit of uh, trickery. So we also look up the address. You see that the address lookup is done directly from the for loop here. And uh, we, we uh, set up a SSL connection. This is the way how you do that with the uh, SSL library in Python. Um, but the, the trick here is to set a verification function because 
uh, we need to know sometimes with some TLSA records the certificate authority certificate instead of the ent entity certificate. TLSA, you, you, you either identify the ent entity certificate or the certificate authority that signed for the ent entity. So that's why we need to verify callback function to find the certificate authority that is, is on the basis of the chain of trust to the end entity certificate. So two more household affairs. Um, oh, sorry about that. So the SN, SNI, huh? uh, uh, IP address and port could host multiple uh, different uh, websites with different names. So you have to connect to the right one to get the right address. And then in the second half, you actually connect to the address. And this is a, a little bit of a dangerous style of error handling of uh, SSL. But the, the, the RFC uh, of operational practices for Dane says, well, we have the name in DNSSEC, so we don't have to check the common name in the certificate anymore. We have a DNSSEC proof that this certificate is for this name. So we don't need to check the name within the certificates. So if it doesn't match us, we, we're just going to pass. We can say, OK, if, we, uh, if the, the wrong host exception is thrown, we're just going to accept that. Um, so this is dangerous because uh, there could be other error. In general, this way of error checking with SSL is dangerous because there might be other errors with the SSL connection. And this could be before the other errors, like the, uh, the certificate might, might have been expired. But I can assure you that with OpenSSL, in this case, it is safe because this is the latest check that is done. But in general, this is not the way to do it, right? So anyway. <laughs> OK, if you don't have TLSAs, you know, do regular uh, PKIX validation. But if you do have TLSAs, then try each TLSA. The first one that matches makes the day, you know. That, um, so uh, the certificate that we are going to check is either the uh, end entity uh, certificate, so the, the peer certificate, or if the certificate usage type was PKIX, trust anchor, or Dane trust anchor, it's the certificate authority certificate. Here we set, set cert to either the uh, end entity certificate or the certificate authority, depending on the TLSA record certificate usage field, then we match the certificate. In Dane, it's possible to do it in uh, uh, several uh, ways. So you either match the complete certificate or you match only the public key, which is convenient because then you can roll the certificate with the same key. And then either you match a SHA of the certificate or the public key or the, the whole thing. Compare the uh, certificate association data with uh, what, what the certificate should have been. If it matches, you say true, Dane validation succeeded and go on with the connection. Otherwise, Dane validation failed and you have to drop the connection. So um, here's a few examples. So uh, Afnik has a, uh, a Dane record, which successfully validates. Very nice. SIDN for .nl has it as well. Also excellent. .uk, however, Sarah. Uh, well. <laughs> OK, so uh, I now have uh, a walkthrough uh, in over how to use the KetDNS API in C. We'll do a synchronous lookup first, then a, uh, extract the data from the response dictionary in C, then do an asynchronous request, 
then use an external event library to do the asynchronous request, um, uh, uh, then have uh, the use of uh, extension dictionaries. So the, the example that I'm going to illustrate is also in a blog post on our website, the simple look lookup example. I uh, created uh, files you uh, are able to compile yourself in uh, this tarball, and it's also on GitHub. And also, as Sarah also mentioned, the it be, uh, below the static uh, directory of the getinsapi.net website is also a copy of the slide deck, by the way, and uh, the Windows version of uh, getinis query and stubby. So this is um, how to do a, uh, a simple query in uh, C. So like uh, with other libraries, success is zero. So it's very convenient to uh, put, put the return status uh, in an if statement. If it has a value, then something is wrong. Um, get error string by ID, that's not uh, that function was not in the official API, that, so that's why we need the getiness extra.h. Um, so we have to assign null to context because if uh, getiness context create does not succeed because of uh, resource depletion or something, it will not touch the context. So in with that um, comparison at the end, if context has set, then destroy it. You know, that only works if we set it to null in the first place. So we have a context, then we can use it to do a query. So uh, uh, we, we make a declaration of um, the response dictionary, do a address lookup, synchronously collect the answer in the response dictionary if it fails, give an error. This still doesn't do anything with the data yet. But what I want to illustrate here is how to chain um, successful f function usage of um, uh, gettiness with if-else. So some, some people, they like to if-else on the successful case, but then if you have many uh, functions that way uh, you, 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 you nest very deeply, and it becomes unreadable. It's a, a style of programming. Uh, other thing that might is the most efficient, actually, is to use GoTo, which, you know, it's forbidden to use GoTo, so uh <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. But you don't need to, if you do it like this, you don't have to assign the null values to the declarations at the start. But also, it's really hard to keep track of wha what you already did and what needs to be, you know, wha what's the escape uh, sequence, right? Um, so testing for zero is for me, in my experience, the most convenient to uh, uh, serialize the requests. And if it's not, if you're not interested in the return code for every single uh, function call, you could also just uh, put them all in one if-else statement, and it makes the whole program a lot more concise. So here's the function that uh, gets the address data from the response dictionary, as I illustrated before, with uh, JSON pointers, slash just address answer, slash zero, to get to the first answer, slash address data to get to the binary blob of the address. So it's, uh, the address is in network format, so we have to convert it to text with INET network to presentation format function. Ah, yeah, so the JSON pointer was introduced by us. Before this, you would have to do get uh, list from respondent get first item from list, then get the bi binary address data from that first item or dictionary item, which is quite verbose. And so this makes it uh, a bit more concise as well. Yes, as I told you before, uh, no data is converted. Uh, 
So Gettiness tries to be uh, as uh, the, the not intrusive in that it doesn't do memory allocations or it tries to limit those to the bare minimum and it just points you to and doesn't do any conversions for you. It just uh, points you to the correct spots in the DNS message and you have to do the conversion yourself. Though it does deliver the functions to do those conversions, but for ad IP addresses, there's also there are already perfectly good uh, functions available in C, so we don't need it there. This is how to do it asynchronously. So the last three arguments of uh, getting this address are now replaced by transaction ID, which I'm not interested in, so it's zero. User argument, also not interested in that, so zero. And then the callback function on top what the callback function looks like. So also non-API function is getting as context run. So this was not in the original API. It's you're supposed to do the uh, event loop running yourself with a asynchronous uh, library. Uh, this is the um, terminology that we use for this. You schedule a request, it's registered, uh, the callback function is registered. Once the event loop runs, it will perform the request and call the fire, the registered callback function once the, the results are there. Uh, this is how to look in, uh, hook in a external event loop. So the event loop used here is uh, libuv. So we have to initialize the uh, loop, or uv loop actually has a default loop which you can use as well. Then uh, set this, uh, associate that uh, libuv uh, event loop with the gettiness context, and then do the ev uv run. So this is how you should do it because you know you're not go going to make a asynchronous program that does only DNS queries. It involves also doing TCP and UDP and whatever, and maybe some uh, user interface input output and for that you need uh, external um, a, a event loop library which is not getDNS. Uh, this is how to the, the include that you have to do, and you also have to link with libuv, obviously, and also with the extension of getDNS using libuv. Each uh, event library has its own extension. Uh, no, but so here is uh, how to get to the uh, all addresses in a callback. So in a callback, we also anticipate a timeout or um, if there are actually no addresses on a certain name. And then at the end is the for uh, list which will uh, traverse over all the uh, answers. So it's since we have to traverse the list, we cannot use JSON pointers here. So we actually have to get the list of just address answers first and then do the for, for, loop, for loop over the just address pointers, get each individual address dict, and then with the dict, get out the address data and uh, print that. Oh, right, so if, uh, you know, uh, the callback type was something else than callback complete, you can <laughs> actually use the get error string by ID for all constants in uh, getTNS. All constants are unique, and it prints out a convenient string message. So note that um, here we use the fact that if you are able to get a uh, dictionary from a list, it returns zero to enter for lib when there are no more addresses and enter for loop. So yeah, it didn't fit all on one screen. Here's the rest, which is the same as what we've seen before with the synchronous query, convert to string and print it. So asynchronous is nice, but so what you would actually want to do in a Dane lookup, in an actual Dane lookup, is schedule the address lookup and the lookup for TLSA simultaneously. 
but maybe for application it's not very important that the address lookup is secure, right? Because you're going to test the endpoint uh, anyway, either with regular PKIX or uh, with the Dane record. So we we schedule the address lookup without uh, the requirement that the answer has to be uh, DNS6 signed, and then create a uh, extension dictionary uh, with a, a DNSSEC return only secure answers and DNSSEC roadblock avoidance for the TLSA record. So if the upstream resolver is DNSSEC aware, it will do it at this, um, as fast, but otherwise the address will return earlier because it has a fallback to full recursion. But you have to guarantee that the TLSA lookup is done with DNSSEC. Um, so this is the old style of uh, configuring a extension dictionary. We, uh, in the 1.1 release, have added a function to actually convert strings to dictionaries, um, which makes it a little bit more concise again. Um, So, um, but if you do the uh, scheduling simultaneously, you need to track uh, whether or not you have to, uh, if, if the other lookup has finished yet. So that's what happened. So the address, ha uh, uh, the scheduling of the address lookup had a uh, callback registered, and it will check if the TLSA already finished. If not, it will wait. And vice versa, the TLSA lookup looks that we already have an address. If not, then just return. If we do it, then try to set up the connection. And a set up connection means uh, what's the status? You know, is it bogus or we don't have TLSA abort? Otherwise, go ahead, set up the TLS connection asynchronously. So this is uh, where the UV TCP connect comes in. Actually, now I think about this, you could already start with a UV TCP connect once you have the addresses, you know, and, and check for the certificate, or, um, and only when the certificate needs to be checked, check if the TLSA already finished, and if not, wait for that, and if it finished, do the comparison of the TLSA record with the certificate. So. The example could be improved, but here's the general ID, and uh, that's uh, the end of the C tutorial. So, Sarah, you wanted to do a uh, demonstration of Stubby. <laughs> yeah, I, c I could also uh, answer questions if there are any. Uh, sorry, uh, Neil O'Reilly. Uh, not a question, but I, I, I just wanted to say I really like the, the non-interventionist layering of, of, of what you're doing. It's like yeah. views in a database or something. Yes, it's, right. it's, it's yeah. really nice. Oh, thank you. Good job. Thanks. <laughs> so what I wanted to show here was just um, uh, the UI on the Stubby application that we've been working on. So the goal here is to have something um, usable for non-technical end users so that they can take advantage of the uh, functionality that GetDNS exposes and in particular we're interested in helping people use DNS over TLS, DNS privacy from their own machine. But of course because this is all built on GetDNS under the hood this still has all the DNS set capabilities that you would want. Um, so this is really uh, at the moment, it's built around the premise of having a daemon running, listening on localhost. And that daemon is catching the queries that come over localhost and feeding them into the GetDNS API and then sending them out over TLS. So at the top, you'll see we have some settings for a service. And fingers crossed, um, let me just bring up the log first, actually, and try and get it so that you can actually see something useful. Apologies, this isn't scaled very well. Um, so I'm going to start the service in the background and then test it. 
And what you see in the log at the moment is um, information about every single TLS connection we set up. So you saw there a connection opened. And if you look at the timestamps, you'll see two seconds later, if I can do that, um, that connection closed. And that's because I have a two second timeout configured on this. But you can extend that up to tens of seconds, if you like, to keep that connection open. And as long as you're actually using it and sending messages, it will stay open. Um, so what we report is we went to that particular server, did a TLS connection, and we got a response back. So all good. So we know the daemon's working. So now I actually want my whole system to use this. So what I have here is a checkbox which lets me go and change the settings uh, for my system resolvers. Um, on Unix, this would be resolve.conf. On Mac, it uses a, a network setup, whatever happens to be the right thing for the platform. So I'm going to choose to do that and then hit apply. And what you should see is that because my system is pretty much always doing DNS queries in the background, I fire off a whole bunch of TLS connections. And I have multiple servers configured. And it also, in this configuration, what I'm doing is I'm spreading my queries across multiple servers so that no one server sees all my traffic and can use that to identify me strongly. So there are different sort of modes you can use here. But we're in the round one one at the moment. And you can see I'm getting information back about how many um, uh, responses I get over a particular connection. I can also look at whether the far end is shutting the connection down. Am I getting timeouts? Um, I can also look at whether or not I authenticated the far end. Um, and in this case, I have the correct credentials, so I'm able to authenticate it. Um, and this is working in strict mode, which means that unless that authentication works, I actually won't proceed with doing my DNS lookups. So this is the um, strong case where you say, I care more about privacy than about DNS service. Um, this, we hope, will turn into more of a connection doctor-like um, output at the bottom, where you'll see all the servers that are available to you. You'll have sort of green or red dots, uh, depending on whether they're authenticating or they're available. And you can also, hopefully, we'll have just a little checkbox where you can just decide which particular servers you want to use. Um, at the moment, all the configuration is done via a text file which uses a JSON-like format. So again, the next job on this UE development is to turn this into something user-friendly, which will have drop-downs and checkboxes and, and um, things like that. Um, but at the moment, you can see, um, hopefully, you can read that we are working in stub mode. We're only allowing TLS as a transport. And we're requiring authentication for the far end. So if I actually wanted to drop back into a more relaxed mode where I was willing to um, uh, do just an encrypted connection to the far end without requiring authentication, because that at least protects me from passive monitoring, if not from active attack, then I can remove that setting and save that config and then apply it, which will restart the daemon. And now if I try and do something to trigger some... Uh, I think I've got, oops, then hopefully you would see that I have switched into opportunistic mode. But as with all good demos, nothing goes perfectly. So that isn't showing. Let me try doing that and just see if um, things work. There we go. So I'm back on strict profile. So. Um, so unfortunately, that doesn't work. But some of these simpler configuration options, again, will just have little check boxes. Um, but what I really want to show here, and I'll talk much more this afternoon about the context for DNS privacy and why we want to make expose this to end users. But um, the point to make here is that having a library as fully featured and as rich as GetDNS has made it really rather straightforward to be able to create an application like this that can expose all the new features of DNS to end users. And we also can, as additional new features come along in future, it's going to be really straightforward to add them into the library and to expose them here. So we're trying to be very flexible and dynamic um, library for applications to rapidly build on top of. Um, okay, so that's uh, everything I wanted to say about Stubby for the moment. So I think we have a little bit of time left. If there are any further questions, we'd be happy to take them. <laughs>